uh, have uh, Dr. Alon Halevi, Professor Alon Halevi, uh, former Professor Alon Halevi, right. here with us. And um, uh, uh, Alon is, um, has done tremendous amount of work and has had uh, very important contributions uh, not only to the information systems and the web community, but also the databases. And the latest work that, they're, that he's part of and, and he's leading at uh, Google of bringing in huge amounts of web data and, and, and uh, bringing it into uh, uh, actual, uh, what we consider to be tables or databases, has is, is been having um, uh, 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 quite a bit of impact. Uh, Alan is... Um, 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 uh, a BK's awardee and ACM uh, fellow, and um, 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 was a former faculty member at the University of Washington. Um, did the same thing that uh, many uh, 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 people in the West Coast do, uh, go to uh, Silicon Valley and had a couple of startups and decided that to stay there. Uh, he did his PhD at Stanford, so uh, uh, um, two uh, successful startups in um, 99 and 2004 and then uh, the latest startup was acquired by Google and um, ended up uh, 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 at Google. Um, the, the talk today is about bringing web databases uh, to the masses and um, 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 thank you. Uh, good afternoon, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, well, thanks for having me. It's, uh, uh, it's really, a, uh, I've been having a great day visiting and talking to everybody. I especially appreciate the lunchtime uh, visit to the espresso shop because it's kicking in right now just at the right moment. Um, so um, four years ago, uh, as Ahmed was saying, I joined Google. And here was a company that, you know, I'm, I was a happy database guy. I still am a happy database guy uh, when I went there. Uh, here's a company whose entire business is based on unstructured data. So they don't think, they didn't really care for structured data, the kind of stuff that fits into uh, columns and rows. Uh, they didn't care about relational database systems. Everything is, you know, MapReduce and you know, everything is one MapReduce away. Um, in addition to that, everybody in the company was about 10 to 15 years younger than me. And so it looked like somebody was setting, my, setting me up for a really bad midlife crisis. Uh, but I decided to take the job anyway. Uh, the, massage, the massages are pretty good. And so I took it uh, as my responsibility to, uh, to figure out what we can do about structured data on the web. So today, there is structured data. Um, there, there are huge amounts of structured data on the web. And this, the data is not being uh, used the way it should be. So you're familiar probably with places where you can go and fill out forms and get patents and, and, and locations of stores. Uh, the big talk today is you know, government data, right? We, we're trying to increase uh, citizen participation in government by making data available, being able to track um, to track where the uh, where all the stimulus money is going. For example, I can, as far as I can tell from my first half day here, it's like you guys are getting a lot of it. Um, and uh, so, so the bigger, better transparency and availability to, uh, of data is supposed to make uh, life better. Except that if you look at um, at the web today, uh, there are a few challenges. Essentially, what I want to do is I want to be able to uh, enable this this uh, ecosystem or this loop um, that that makes it possible to leverage structured data. So let me start from the top. So if you can't find structured data on the web, okay, that's that's a problem. Okay. So the first thing you want to be able to do is if I'm looking for data somewhere, like on a search engine, and I'm looking, and the answer is some, somehow in structured data. It should come up. That is not that. Uh, that is a challenge. Okay. A lot of the data is stored behind forms in databases behind forms, and it's called the invisible web, okay, or the deep web, and so it's not in the search engine index. You're not going to find it. Uh, a lot of the stuff is actually sitting there in HTML tables, beautiful tables on the web, and we still don't do a very good job at ranking it when uh, when when the query is uh, when when we get relevant queries. Even suppose you found. The, the, the structured data. If you want to do something with it, okay, you need to be able to 
take it out. You need to be able to schnoozle it out of the web page, out of its current context, and put it into some data management system where you can start doing things like exploration, like selections, like, like uh, filtering, maybe visualize it, or maybe join it, or do, do combinations of data with other, uh, other data sources. So you need to extract the data, and that's a challenge uh, in itself, because people didn't put the data there in any format where they were expecting that it would be um, extracted. Uh, then you need tools. You need to, to, uh, tools to actually do so. Suppose you extracted it. You need tools to combine the data, to analyze it, to visualize it. And these are hard. These are usually separate systems, right? They're, they're, they're database systems that are, are, are uh, harder to, to deal with and certainly not available easily to people, to the typical user on the web. And the final part of the loop is publishing. So suppose I found data, or suppose I've, I have data that is sitting in my database and I really want to make it public, uh, available to everybody. They're bringing it to, uh, to the public, publishing it on the web, requires some skills uh, uh, and, is, and is not easy to do. So we've got challenges all across this, uh, this, this, uh, this loop, okay? And what my talk is gonna be about today um, is a few of the projects that we're doing at Google that are trying to address, uh, uh, address these challenges. Okay, so these are some of the projects that we've done uh, in my group over the last few years, and I make absolutely no claim that we've solved the problem, or I'm not even gonna make a claim about how much of the problem we solved. We're just making some first, uh, what I think are interesting steps. So I'm gonna be talking about discovery first. I'm gonna talk about our project that actually takes, or tries to take um, uh, content that is invisible to search engines and may put it in the index so you can actually get it um, when you search. Uh, we, I'm gonna talk about a project that uh, looks at all this data that is visible. I mean, it's not invisible, but not, not being exploited well. So we're gonna look at all the nice tables that are sitting there on the web waiting for something good to happen. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we extract some of the tools that we were building to, uh, to extract data and, and uh, bring it into data management systems. And finally, I'm gonna talk about, you're gonna see as, my, as we reach the end of the talk, my excitement will rise because it's a more recent project. I'm gonna be talking about a tool called Fusion Tables that we launched um, three months ago on Google Labs, which is a sort of a database in the cloud that is focused on, um, on real people, okay? I apologize to all the non-real people here. But the, uh, the idea is to make it easier for people to, uh, to uh, upload data, manage it, uh, and publish it, share it, collaborate, and, and, and uh, share it, publish it to the web. Um, my favorite statistic about this system is that the day, the day after it was launched, uh, we looked at the logs, and in the first 24 hours after the launch, uh, people from 118 countries uh, at least examine the system at, at some level, and that includes all the countries that claim to be the birthplace of Barack Obama. So, um, and I welcome, I welcome questions at uh, any stage of the, uh, of the talk. So, um, so let's start with the deep web. So this is the first problem. Actually, when I came to Google, I came from this little company called Transformic, and we had some technology for, uh, for doing stuff on the deep web. And what the, uh, what the executives at Google told me was, go take care of that, okay? Give me people. No, I didn't say we're, we're not giving you people. Just go take care of it. At Google, you're supposed to be able to do things with, um, in small groups. Uh, so we, uh, three of us, uh, this is uh, Jane Maravan, um, another engineer and myself, we started looking at the, at the deep web uh, problem. So what is the issue here? The issue is a web crawler comes to a form, gets stuck, right? All the real good content is, is sitting in a database and when a, a real user uh, comes in and submits a query to this form, then you get an HTML, back, uh, HTML page back and you, uh, and you see good stuff. Okay, but the crawler can't get to this content, and the page itself with the form has very little uh, in terms of, of what the of, of characterization of what the, the data is about. Okay, so the deep web is about all kinds of things. You're looking for used cars, for planes, for radio stations, patents, recipes, uh, stuff like that. So one possible solution, which is what we were doing um, before we came into Google is to build a vertical uh, solution for each one of them. So there are thousands of, uh, thousands of websites that will give you used cars, okay? And what you want is, uh, is you want a, one website 
where you can go and you'll submit a query. You're looking for your Toyota Corolla 2005 in Palo Alto, and it'll find all the relevant uh, newspapers in the area, online newspapers, and all the other websites, and it'll send the query only to the relevant sites and somehow give you all the results back, and you don't have to worry about the fact that it just went to 30 different sites. Okay? Um, now, like what Kayak does. Okay, in fact, this is, as, as uh, you know, I've been a data integration person for way too many years, this is the solution that a data integration person would come. It's called a mediator. This form up here is a mediator. You provide certain mappings between the, the, form, the diff individual forms and, and this form here, and the right things happen. Okay? So, um, so this would have been great, and this, we did this for six domains. The problem is, this works for domains that have thousands and thousands of sites for that particular, uh, in that particular domain. But uh, the deep web is about all kinds of things. It's about searching for trees in Pennsylvania, Amish quilts, also from Pennsylvania, parking tickets in India, really important, and uh, horses for sale in, not sure where this is, I thought it was China, but that's, it wouldn't be in English then. Um, so the point is, there is a huge, uh, sorry, long and heavy tail, okay? And, and what Google wanted is not to go and do used cars really well. They wanted the whole, the, the, the long and heavy tail, they wanted to cover everything, um, everything that you can cover, okay? Which meant that even though in our previous solution we, we were able to incorporate a new website in three to five minutes, Okay, that's three to five minutes too much. Okay, what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to look at any form on the web and do the right thing with absolutely no human intervention. Okay, that was, uh, those were our marching orders. Okay, so, so today I would say there are three flavors of deep web work. Okay, ones that I told you about the vertical search. Okay, here, so this is the used cars example. Okay, here's, you're going to build a, car, uh, a site that goes and does cars really well. Okay, but if you're going to do cars really well, you better do reviews and you better be able to do, you know, uh, all kinds of other things that people want to do when they buy cars. So, for example, if you went to Kayak and you got all these different flights from 140 different websites, if you can't buy the ticket, it ain't good. Okay, so you need to have a much broader business uh, um, story in order to do that. Okay, and that only works in particular domains. So you're not going to make much money out of looking for quilts, Amish quilts, uh, as a vertical. You're just not going to do it. Okay, so that's a vertical search. It's, it's, there are a bunch of domains where it works really well, and there are individual companies that do this. The second kind is search for anything. Okay, so this is what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get users to any kind of content on the web. Okay, and our goal here is just to get the users to the right place. Okay, so if there is a site that is relevant to parking tickets in India, we just want to be able to bring you there when your query is relevant to that. The third category is actually really interesting. Is it's sort of in between. It's product search. So it's not narrow enough that you can call it uh, vertical search because the space of products is really wide, but it's also not uh, a search for anything. And that's every search company um, has a, a you know, pretty significant effort going around, uh, around product search. The reason is there's a lot of money there, so um, it's a good thing to do. So this is what we had to do. We had to do the, um, the uh, search for anything. And furthermore, we couldn't allow for any, uh, at query time, we're not allowed to mess around with the system. Okay? <laughs> You're new to Google. You don't mess around with anything that is, uh, you know, that is critical to the users. So our solution was based on what we call the surfacing approach. So in the background, we go... On the index, we find forms, okay, and, um, and we try to do something with them. So we, tr we look at the form really, really hard, and we try to figure out good queries to submit to the form, okay, relevant queries, queries that won't embarrass Google, okay, and, which is, uh, you know, not always hard, uh, easy to do. So if we, we figure out these queries, we try not to have too many of them to not bring down any, uh, any servers. Okay, and we get pages back from these sites. These are HTML pages that look like any other HTML page. We put them in the index, the Google index, and then we get out of the way. Okay, that's what we do. So now at, at, cert, at query time, these pages get ranked like any other page. Okay, and, uh, and that's the approach. 
Okay. Now the important thing. So what we do is we put in the index a URL that has sort of blah 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 something get and then the parameters the, the parameter value. So when you actually click on the on the URL, you're actually going to the website and submitting a query at that point. And so you're getting you know the most up to date Toyota Corollas from 2005 that you uh, that you can find. Okay. Now this is this is where the midlife crisis comes in, okay? Because we're using some semantic knowledge in order to figure out what to, what queries to submit to this form, right? I mean, you can argue, depending on what, what uh, you know, what kind of person you are, you might argue that we are not using semantics. But the point is, we know what query we used in order to get this page, okay? But once we got the page, we took that page, we threw it into the index, and goodbye semantics. We don't do anything uh, anything about the sem we don't leverage the semantics in any way during the ranking. Okay, so the advantage of this approach is that it reuses as much as possible the Google infrastructure. We just look at the form. We're sort of sitting on the side. We look at the form. We submit a bunch of queries. We get a bunch of pages. Then our system says, "Okay, here are these URLs. Go crawl these URLs. Put these in the in or you select whether they should go into the index or not." and you figure out how to rank these pages when queries come in. Okay? Are you saying that these are pages that wouldn't have been indexed previously? Yes, definitely. So, so they were purposely ignored? Or? We couldn't find them. So uh, what, for example, I, I would find a page which is, um, you know, find me Toyota Corolla 2005 in Palo Alto. So I would, we, we, our system would actually fill the values in, these, in the form with relevant values. And so then I get, I get a page back and that goes into the index. Okay? Without, before that, the, the crawler was just, hey, I'm seeing a form, I can't do anything, I'm just putting the form page. I'll get to that in a sec. Don't, don't let me get out of here without explaining that. Okay? Um, so, in fact, uh, this is what I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about right now. So there are, there are, there are two big challenges um, in, uh, in doing this, okay? The first one is, um, is actually figuring out which fields you're going to query. So there are a lot of forms out there that have 10 fields, 20 fields, okay? Even if you knew what are the relevant values in each one of the fields, if you submitted the cross product, you're going to bring down the site, you're going to get a lot of really bad pages, and things are going to look very ugly. So for example, um, in cars.com, you have only 500, half a million actual cars, okay? but the number of queries that you can generate is 250 million. So you need some smarts over there, and that's, that's what I'm going to talk about in a moment. The second problem is predicting the values. So you have two, pos two options here. One is you have a field that is a drop-down menu. We're happy. Drop down menu. I just start, I just try all the values. Okay, this is um, you don't you don't need to think about that for too long. The problem is when you have text fields that are that can accept any uh, any, any English word. Okay, or sorry, any word in any language. Okay, this is this is working in fifty languages. Um, so there we actually use a technique that was sort of uh, uh, developed over the years, which is iterative probing. We look at the words on the form. Okay, we submit those. And those generate certain pages back. And then we look at the pages that come back, and those tend to have more words. And so you sort of look around, and, and you find, uh, you find good, uh, good words to submit to these particular text fields. Okay? The, the problem of which... Um, so now I have the, the, the problem of... Uh, yeah? Right. How are you dealing with things like that? Uh, so when, when you submit, so first of all, the, the, there are cases where you actually have to do several steps in order to, to actually get to the content. Like in real estate sites, you have to select the state first, and then the county, and then the neighborhood. But we don't deal with those. Okay? Uh, we don't deal with those directly. I'll, I'll explain a little later how it might be done uh, anyway. Um, when, the, when the values change, then, then when you actually apply the action, then that the, the JavaScript already does the right thing, and and uh, and, and we get the right uh, the right thing. Okay, but 
um, there are cases there where that, that we don't we don't uh, handle arbitrary um, JavaScript right now. Okay. Um, so here there's a, a cute idea which which actually was really key to to uh, the success of this project, which is we need to decide which fields we're actually going to give inputs to. Okay. So. Essentially, what we developed is the, the idea of an informative field. So suppose I have a field like, uh, what is this, job search, where you have different states. Okay? If I submit different values of the red box up there, and I look at the pages that come back, the pages are different from each other. Okay? That means that that value is somehow discriminating between pages, which probably means that it's an informative, uh, it's a good field uh, to use in order to, to get uh, good content back. On the other hand, if I, uh, if I look at, at the other box where it's, it's, uh, it's basically rearranging results or doing transformations that aren't actually affecting the, the answers, then you're going to get pages that are very, very similar to each other. So a, f a field is informative if when I submit different values to that field, I'm getting very different pages. Okay, so now you start from fields that are informative and you try to grow them into field combinations. Okay, you look for, for sets of two fields that are informative, and so on and so forth. And like everything in computer science, you stop when it's three, because you, never, you rarely need more than that. Except in our experiments, actually, it, it, we rarely needed more than uh, combinations of, of three fields. Okay, so there's a page, uh, there's a, an entire paper about, uh, about these algorithms in the VLDB proceedings from last year. Um, but what I like to emphasize is the impact of all this. So we crawled, and again, these are numbers from about a year and a half ago, so choose your favorite factor uh, greater than one and multiply. Uh, we crawled about three million sites at the time. I, that says three million sites were, uh, three million forms were deemed actually interesting to crawl. So we, we started from far more uh, sites than that. This is in 50 languages, so there's nothing language specific uh, in our system. We seem to have really good impact in Korean. And yeah, Korean was was really strong. I don't know why. Um, this is my best. This is my favorite line. One thousand queries per second on Google.com today get in the top ten results some result from the deep web. Okay, so the pages that we put on the index uh, come up in a thousand queries per second. Okay, and um, and in terms of the number of forms, so it's not all you know seventeen forms that are that are generating all this traffic. Every day we serve data from 400,000 forms, and every week we generate uh, we we serve data from uh, almost a million forms. Okay, so this is really the long and heavy tail. So the, one of the observations from our experiments was, or our, our observations for looking at the data is, you don't really need deep web content in order to answer queries about Britney Spears. There's plenty of data out there uh, to satisfy that query. It's the long and heavy tail, it's the stuff that doesn't have a lot of content out there that, is, that becomes um, really useful um, from, the deep, uh, from the deep web. Any questions about this part? Okay, so, um, so again, so, so I'm going back to the issue of semantics and now we, you know, some of what we did can be considered that we're leveraging the semantics. You know, the words that we put in are based on some semantic analysis of, uh, of the form. Uh, but really, we did very, you know, as a database guy, uh, you know, I'm sad. Not too sad, but, you know, this works, so I'm, I'm not going to complain. But, but it's not like, you know, the, what I was, I was raised up to be, uh, a semantics guy, had uh, too much uh, impact here. So we started looking for places where there is structure, there is semantics, and we can, we can start doing things with, um, with them. And actually, I, sh I, should, I should be a little more careful. There, there are cases where the semantics do make a difference. So for example, if you see a field that you think is zip code, then it's very, it turns out to be very easy to test whether a field is zip code or not. Because if it's, if it, if it's zip code and you provide something other than the zip code, it's going to give you junk very quickly. Okay, whereas other fields that take any English word will not give you junk fast enough. Okay, so, so for example, zip codes and a few other uh, domains like uh, data types like that are very, very useful. So for example, zip code is a way of indexing into anything. It can be uh, you know, parking tickets or it can be uh, public records or what have you. So that's one place where we used um, some of the semantics. But um, there are places where we have 
beautiful tables sitting uh, on the web and, uh, and, and the question was what to do with them. So here I'm going to talk, so we're moving a little bit to the right here. Uh, I'm going to talk about our project for finding all the HTML tables on the web and some of the beginning of what we do in order to extract them. Okay, so this is, um, this is one, of the, you know, one of the fun things that I had uh, uh, working at Google. You ask a question and every answer is like one map reduce away. So look at this table, beautiful table, right? It's giving you a relational data. You would put this in a relational database if you, if you just had one, right? So an interesting question is, um, how many tables like this are there? Okay, and what, what can we do with them? Okay, so, so, um, so you apply a map reduce and you get the answer. Um, and this is work that, uh, that was started by Mike Caffarella. Uh, who was a PhD student at Washington and now is joining the faculty at Michigan. Um, so the answer is 14 billion. Okay, if you just look at the main Google index and you restrict yourself to uh, only English documents, which is roughly, I would say, half, half the, the total documents, um, you find 14 billion tables. Okay, but the vast majority of these tables are absolute nonsense, or rather they're useless. Okay, I'm being kind to them. Uh, people use tables uh, in HTML in order to structure uh, calendars, in order to put things nicely in a grid, stuff like that. Okay, so the vast majority, ni over 98% of these tables, have, <laughs> have z you would not ever think of putting them in a, um, a database system. So we applied a bunch of rules and we trained the machine learning algorithm on, uh, on a thousand tables. You know, what is a good table, what is a bad table? And we were left with 154 million tables that we believe are good relational tables. Okay? That's only five orders of magnitude more than any database system uh, that I know about. Okay? So that's still a nice, you know, for a database guy, 154 million tables, that's, that's like a serious, uh, you know, Disneyland type experience. Okay? Uh, it also teaches you a, a lesson in investing. Okay? How do you, how do you make a, a billion dollars? You start with 10 billion you start invest, and, you, and you invest, right? And then, and then you get to uh, whatever you want. So now these, da these tables are not, uh, are not the, the normal tables that you would find in a database system. Okay? The, in a database system, you have the notion of schema that bef you know, before, you have, uh, before you declare the schema, you can't do, uh, you can't do anything else. So here, they're, they're relatively simple databases, right? They're one, they're a single table, okay? The schema, at best, you might have a row in the beginning of the table that says, here are the names of the columns, okay? There's actually a construct in HTML. When you, when you use a table construct in HTML, there's actually a way of saying, here is my header row, okay? Which obviously nobody knows about because uh, on the web, you hardly, you know, maybe in 1% of the cases, people use it. So, so that doesn't work. So, uh, so you have to sort of extract, uh, extract the schema here. Now, nobody tells you also what this table is about. Okay, so you can, have a you can have a table that says name year. This can be the winners of the Boston Marathon. This can be the winners of the Nobel Prize. This can be the whatever you want. It's not, it's not in the table. You can't extract it in a, in a reliable fashion. Okay, uh, so what we did in the web table system is... Um, First of all, we started, let's, let's go here. So, so we, we drew a bunch of beautiful pictures. Uh, the, the, so the first thing we did was we started extracting these things. Okay, first of all, figure out what tables are actually interesting to even put into this corpus, how to extract the schema, so the fact we had to develop an algorithm that decided whether the first row is, uh, is attribute names or not. Okay, forget about data type. There is no such thing as data type here. Okay, you have what you have. Okay. Um, and, you know, we, we tried to gather some of the stuff that is around the table that maybe will give us clues as to what this table is about. And then, um, uh, and then we asked the question of, okay, now that we have this corpus of 154 million tables, how do you do search? Okay, so what I want here is, you give me a keyword query, I want to give you a ranked list of tables that, uh, that is a good answer to your query. Now, I have to admit that this, I think, even though we did some work on this, is still a very open problem. Okay, this is, this is not something we solved, and the reason we didn't solve it is because we got excited about something else in the meantime. Uh, or we thought we solved it really quickly, and then and we got excited about this other thing, and, um, and now we're coming back to it. So, the amazing thing about 154 million schemas, uh, uh, tables, is that you have a lot of schemas, okay, when you can extract them. So, what we have in this collection um, 
is only from the tables that we were able to very reliably extract the schemas. Okay, just that gave us two and a half million schemas. Okay, you have to put this in perspective, right? I mean, I, in, in a previous project when I was a faculty member, I worked three years in order to get a collection of 60 schemas by torturing undergraduate students for quarter after quarter. Uh, and then one of my students was able to do a PhD thesis based on it. 2.6 million schemas just out of, um, uh, as a present is, yeah? What do you mean exactly by schema? Here? Just the rows, the, the, sorry, the column headers. So, uh, you have one four million uh, tables, and somehow you just, uh, so we have many tables that uh, follow the same schema? We have many tables that follow the same schema, and we have many tables where we're not sure whether the first row is a schema or not. So here we took only the tables that we were very confident that we actually got the schema, and we removed uh, the duplicates. I was disappointed too. Only 2.6 million schema, what are you talking about? But I... Uh, but all of your schemas are simple table, one table, right? One table schemas, yes. I, I, should, I should be very clear about this. Everything here is one table, okay? Which makes uh, our, our lives a little, uh, a little easier. But we're gonna, you know, we're gonna try to combine these things into multi, multiple tables. Um, and in those, we had 5.4 million attributes. Okay, so what we did was we created a, a simple database, okay, where we took all the combinations of the, of the attribute names, and we started doing some counting games. Okay, so the, the algorithms are going to be very simple, but the, the results are going to be uh, kind, of, kind of cool. So it's called the Attribute Correlation Statistics Database. Essentially, you're trying to count how many times does you know, job title, company, and date occur together. So if you, if you have a, uh, you know, here we have 104 uh, tables that, or schemas where these three attributes occur together. Okay, this is an, an amazing resource for anybody who studies heterogeneity uh, in data. Okay, I should, I should also make a point here. The, this data, this ACS uh, DB, in other words, the collection of all the schemas, is data is actually a file that I can send you um, or you can download and you can start playing around with it. I would have loved, more than loved, to take all this collection of uh, web tables and make it, make it public so other people can, um, can play around with it because I certainly don't have enough time to, to do everything that can be done with it. The problem is, as you can imagine, there are lawyers. Lawyers are trouble. Um, so, uh, uh, I should know, I'm married to one. The, um, the <laughs> sorry, I, we're not recording this, are we? The, the, um, uh, the point here is that it turns out, okay, lawyers can invent all kinds of interesting stories. It turns out that when you uh, sit down to create a, tab a, a table, a relational table, you're actually creating intellectual property. Why? Because only you have decided to put a certain set of columns together in a way that is very special to you. Okay, so if you're ever having a really, really bad day and you want to feel productive before you go to sleep, just sit down and create a spreadsheet. Okay, you've, you've created intellectual property, you can feel good about yourself. So because of that, and because um, for some reason Google attracts many lawsuits, the, uh, we can't just take all this intellectual property and make it available uh, just like that, okay? I'm still negotiating with the lawyers and, and we'll see what I can do. But, but for now, the schema information, since it's so far removed from the original stuff, is not a problem and I can, I can point you to where it is. Okay, so we have 2.6 million schemas. What are we gonna do with them? Okay, so one is schema autocomplete. Okay, wouldn't it be nice if you're creating a spreadsheet and you're gonna record something about cars to start saying make, model, uh, give me the rest. And maybe the rest will be attribute names that people have used before and so when we start integrating data across multiple databases we won't all end up with very, very different names. So you can actually, uh, uh, using a very, very simple algorithm, it's so simple that I put the code up on a slide, uh, you can actually create a, a schema autocomplete algorithm. So for example, if you look at, uh, you, you start with instructor, there's the second row up there, then you'll get time and title and days and room and course. Okay, so this is, these are the tables that include instructor. The fourth row there is a test uh, to see whether you should get an American citizenship or not. Um, it's too late, huh? Uh, it's about, it's baseball, okay? I see a few people who actually know what I'm talking about. Um, the other um, 
Another one of them, another algorithm that you can uh, build with 2.6 million schemas is uh, finding synonyms. So the biggest problem in, in dealing with multiple databases is that if I create a database and you create a database, we can talk about the same thing, we're going to use different names. Okay? And if we don't use different names, that means we cheated. Okay, so this is, this is well known from experiments on, on unsuspecting undergraduate students. Okay, so the problem is how to, find, uh, how to find column names that actually mean the same thing, okay, but, uh, but have different names. And the problem is not, it's not like, you know, I go to a, I use a word and, and you go to a thesaurus and, and just, you decide to use a different word. No, the attribute names are, are a place where people become very creative and, uh, and they use all kinds of acronyms and, and, uh, and stuff like that. So it's not stuff that you can find uh, in a dictionary. So what we did with this algorithm is, again, a very simple algorithm, is we look for pairs of attribute names, okay, that never occur together. They never occur in the same table together but they always occur with the same other stuff, okay? So that means maybe they're the same thing, except people have, have used um, uh, different, uh, different names. So here, uh, you can see for yourself, uh, so for example, in the, if, if the, so the left column is the context. So if you have tables, the synonymy in this case also is very context dependent, okay? Because, um, because name, the attribute name can occur anywhere, okay? Uh, so, for example, in the con when a table has the word uh, attribute elected, well, candidate is synonymous with name, presiding officer is synonymous with speaker. You can see some of the other uh, examples. Okay? So, this, you're getting this for free just by analyzing a huge amount of structured data here. This, is what, this was one of our sort of, wow, we can, we can do this uh, with all this data. Um, and again, this is not a complete solution to schema matching. This would be just another... Uh, way of saying, well, maybe uh, you know, maybe candidate and name is the same thing on the, in this context, but you'd you'd actually look at other uh, uh, aspects of your tables to decide whether they're really synonymous or not. So the point here is, lots of data. In this case, lots of structured data. You can get some pretty interesting uh, things going on. Um, so now we're back to uh, to the data itself, and actually, I claim, and, and we're only starting to investigate this, um, that the data itself has a lot of potential. Okay, the fact that you have 154 million tables um, has uh, has all kinds of things that, that you can do with it, and, and some uh, some people have already done it. Um, one of them I'll talk about in a minute that uh, work that Hazem did when uh, when he was visiting Google uh, about segmenting lists. So you can actually the fact that people put stuff in cells is going to be a strong hint as to uh, uh, what they mean. Okay, so now, so we did a little bit of extraction because we had to get the, the tables out of the web pages, but now let me very quickly talk about a project that, uh, that really focuses on the extraction. So here's, here's a question for you, okay, or another question, a, a, go, uh, um, a task, okay. Suppose you wanted to create the list of all VLDB program committee members from the last 10 years, okay. This is, this is a horrendous task, okay? But it's not because the data isn't there. The data is on the web, okay? And if you look for, you know, any particular year and say VLDB Program Committee 2003, bam, you'll find it, okay? The problem is it's on, and now we start with a video, okay? The problem is that on, if for each year somebody else had the wonderful task of maintaining the website, right? And therefore the data looks different and uh, there is no rule or, or there's no algorithm that will just go and, and extract this data for you, okay? Um, and furthermore, these people never thought that one day somebody's going to want to create uh, uh, this, this Uber list, this Uber, Uber uh, table, and so there are 150 million tables out there, actually at least twice that much, sitting and waiting for people to do stuff, but the, the creators of this data didn't think that it would be integrated with other data someday. So how can you provide a tool that would enable you to actually get stuff to take those tables together and, and do the right thing? Now, in general, data integration systems focus on the case where you're going to work pretty hard to set up a system because you're going to use that, you're going to submit a bunch of queries to, those, to that system very many times. So, for example, a customer care agent at, uh, at AT&T, okay, they're going to integrate, they're going to work hard to make sure that all the 20 databases that are relevant to the customer care agent are, are there's some common interface to them because they're answering, you know, thousands of calls every day. 
but something tells me you know you don't want to create a table of, of VLDB PC members every, you know a thousand times a day. So this means that the effort that you need that that is going to be required from you needs to be much lower. So there needs to be a system that lets you do stuff with very little effort, even though the end result you might not keep around for a long time. Okay, so it's it's sort of on the fly integration. So it's, it's a different trade-off from different from um, traditional data integration systems. So what we did was we created a system called Octopus. Okay, this is work, uh, again, by Mike Caffarella, and, and one of the big components of it is, is what Hazem created in, uh, in his work that gives you a bunch of operators and an environment to do this. Okay, so what you're actually trying to do here is, is trying to do several things at the same time. You're trying to find the data on the web. You're trying to extract it uh, from from the web page, and then you're trying to put it together, but when you, try to, when you put it together, you have to also fill out the, the, the context. Okay, so for example, um, uh, if I have the list of PC members from 2003, the page itself doesn't, doesn't have 2003 next to every, uh, every PC member, right? That would kind of look ridiculous. So you have to get the context, you have to get the fact that this is about 2003, uh, from the page somehow in order to, to union it with 2004 and 2005, right? Because you, you actually want that information. Some of the information is implicit in the page. It's not, uh, it's not explicit. The other problem, which, which uh, Hazem solved for us, is that a lot of the useful information is actually not in tables, which was sort of sad because we, you know, well, I'll, I won't comment whether it's sad or not. There, there are a lot of lists on the web. That everything I showed you here was actually lists. It wasn't, it wasn't tables. And the problem is that a list is an, a single item that represents an entire row in a table. So the question is, how do you take a, li a list item and segment it in the right places to put things into the right, into the right cells? Okay, so one of the observations in, in Hazem's algorithm is, well, if there is some table on the web that has this particular set of string in a cell that somebody told, then somebody is telling you that this value, University of California at Berkeley, that is a, an interesting entity. So maybe, so, so when you try to segment the, the list into a table, that could be a, a good hint as to where to put the splitters. Okay, so here we're using the information from web tables in, a, in an interesting way. Okay, so I won't say much more about, um, about these projects. Now I'll go to the last part which is fusion tables. Any questions so far? Okay. So everything we've, doing, we've been doing so far was sort of, uh, I don't know, passive aggressive, right? We were taking data that is, that is already on the web and we're trying to do something interesting with it. Okay, now we're turning to the other side of this, which is saying, um, suppose I actually want to manage data. Suppose I have data, it's locked up in my silos and I want to make it available to people on, on, on the web. So this is Fusion Tables that we launched uh, three months ago. And you can go to tables.googlelabs.com and, and play around with it. Um, so the question is, first of all, and actually some of my conversations today, you know, you guys are talking to, uh, to scientists. So you, you know exactly what's on this list because scientists have, have all these problems, right? We talk to scientists too. Um, so. So first of all, what, why is it so hard to, ch to share data on the web? So first of all, it's, it's hard to do. Setting up a database system is not something that, um, <laughs> that is you know, particularly fun, especially if you're, um, if you're a normal person. Uh, the, uh, a harder problem is a lack of incentives. Why should I, why should I put it up there? Okay, so I'm, I'm afraid. I'm, first of all, I'm afraid to lose control of my data. I'm afraid that people will interpret it in the wrong way. They won't give me attribution, okay? Um, but why should I put it? If, 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 if people aren't going to be able to find it in search, then what's the point, right? If, if Google, uh, you know, pointed you to the data every time it was relevant to your query, great. But, but that goes back to my big loop, which is you have to make the data uh, discoverable. Um, and you also have to make it sort of pretty, okay? People don't like looking at tuples. I know, this is really sad, as database field. We don't like looking at tuples. Uh, so you need to look at maps. Um, and then, of course, the other issue is that it's very hard to uh, integrate. It's very hard to share data with people in other organizations. Okay, so uh, you either have to give them uh, uh, the ability to access your own database, or you need to uh, or you have to do something else. So we were trying. The goal of Fusion Tables is to build a database system. I'll say for real users. Okay, 
for we're not focusing on large amounts of data and uh, and you know complicated SQL queries and high throughput transactions. That's you know we, I know people who know this how to do this better than we. Well, we're focusing on what can we do in order to make data collaboration around data much more uh, uh, happening. Okay, that those are the goals. So uh, this is work with uh, Jane Maravand, uh, Hector Gonzalez, um, Anno Langen, Rebecca Shapley, and myself. We built this over the last, uh, I say we, some people on this list built, others managed um, over the last year. Um, I'll let you guess who did what. Um, and so, so we, we divide it into, we make sure there are incentives for people to upload their data onto the web, okay? So you, uh, it's very easy, okay, people just, we make it very easy to upload your data. I'll show you in a moment. Attribution is sticky. So I can, if you put your name or whatever you want on your data, we will never lose it and we will never show that data without the attribution no matter what happens to the data, okay? Um, and you can very carefully control who can do what to your data. I'll show you this uh, in a minute. Um, it's easy to share your data with other people or with the world. Um, it's easy to bring together data from multiple tables, even if they belong to different organizations. And one of the cool things that we have is, uh, again, as you've already found out, uh, people, you know, managing the data is not the end of the game. You see the data, you start having disagreements, especially scientists, they have to disagree about something, so they start arguing about their data. So you want to be able to let it, people uh, have the ability to discuss their data in a meaningful way. So let me just show you a few screenshots. Um, so this is what the upload is, looks like. I, I, can, I can actually do this live, because it's a live system, but I'm, um, I'm choosing the easy, easy way out here. So for example, I, uh, I happen to be a slight coffee nut, um, so I'm going to upload a table about the consumption of coffee in various places around the world. And I'm going to, uh, what you see up there is that my name, so I want that data to always be associated with my name. So you can show a table or visualization, it'll always have my name on it, okay? Um, even though I did not actually create the data. Um, so this is a great tool for stealing data. Um, and uh, don't quote me on that. The, uh, so here you get a table, uh, that, um, a table with the data. And now what the system is doing is uh, it's starting to look, so I, there's nothing about a schema here, right? I didn't say schema, just upload your data. Schema, I don't know how to, how to, how to spell that. Uh, what, the data, what the system is doing is it's looking at some of the columns and it notices that the second column here is a location. Okay, why? Because we happen to work for a company who, uh, who does something with maps. So because it's a location, the system will say, uh, will give you this visualize menu and it'll, uh, you'll be able to look at it on a map or on an intensity map. Okay, I know this is this seems very um, how can I say uh, simple, but people just love this. This is this is the the carrot that you give people for uploading their data. And so, 30 seconds later, I'm looking at the data on the map. Okay, so 95% of people in the world have never actually seen their data. I just made that up, but. <laughs> Uh, but actually, no, I heard from a very famous economist that 95% of all statistics are made up on the fly. Okay, so I've now, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm behaving like a true economist. Okay, so, um, oh, this is really, this, I mean, this is the feedback that we're getting. And, and when you launch a product or something at Google, you get a feedback about, you know, half an hour at most later. Uh, people just love seeing their data. Okay, this, is, this is, gives, gives them uh, a lot of insight. Of course, you can do some um, uh, filtering and aggregation here uh, the way uh, you would as a, as a, as a database person. Uh, the, the other nice thing that you can do is, this, this looks beautiful, doesn't it? What you can do is you can take this, uh, you, you want to put this map somewhere else on the web. So you actually have a blog about coffee, and now you just want to put that map there just like you put videos. So now we help you spread the goodness uh, to other web properties. Okay, so you just take it, copy and paste this, this uh, HTML, you put it anywhere you want, and now if you update your data, then that map will be um, always kept up to date. Okay? Um, sharing. So this is sort of similar to Google Docs, uh, for those who are familiar with it. Uh, you, can, you can define people to be um, owners, which means they can do anything to the data. They can be viewers, so they can only look at the data, but they can't change it. Um, they can be col um, contributors. This is actually an important one. 
So a lot of the time, and this was what uh, the sort of the use case that inspired us to, to do all this, what happens is um, I have data and you have data. We're talking about the same things, okay? But all we want to do is see the data side by side, okay? So I'll be very specific about this. So a couple of years ago, Google sent a bunch of us to, um, for a weekend in Costa Rica. Uh, to talk to a bunch of scientists there. So there's this guy from UPenn, Daniel Jansen, who spends half of his time for the last 30 years, and he's collecting all the species uh, in Costa Rica. Okay, Costa Rica happens to have like 5 or 10% of all the species. I think we're talking about moths. Okay, I don't test me on biology here too much. Uh, so he's, he, ha he has a whole system there where people go and collect these uh, specimens and annotate them. They put them in, in, into a database. So he has his own database. Okay, but then he takes, he actually made us do this. We take a leg off the poor thing, which it's not a poor thing anymore because it was frozen overnight. We take the leg and we send it to a lab in Canada where there they, they do the genome sequencing of this and they get what's called a barcode, which is a, a sequencing of part of the genome. And they add a whole bunch of other columns to this table. Okay, and then they need to go and put these things into PubMed or something like that. So what you're, what's happening is you have these rows and these rows are being expanded with different columns by different organizations. But the only way for them to do that right now is to send files across the wire and have, okay, now go and do this, which means that about, uh, you know, you, you get immediately 70 different versions of these files sitting around everywhere on the web and, and that's, that's not a good situation. So here they can have all the data in the cloud and they can just have people adding their own columns as they need to. So this is, this is again, this is not rocket science, but this is based on talking to real scientists in the field and taking all the ideas from data integration and saying, what's the simplest possible thing that I can do to actually help these people? Okay, so that's the experiment that we're doing here. We're saying, how can we build a system that is really, really easy to use and doesn't actually use all the cool stuff from computer science that we have, you know, that we as, as database people or computer scientists uh, love to do. Chris, have a question? Ah, because, no time. We, had to, we, we were told to launch in, uh, on May 1st. And so we said, okay, we're going to do columns. And it turns out people actually want to merge rows. And so there are people um, possibly working on it, even as we speak. Uh, possibly. So yeah, so that, that actually happens, uh, happens quite a bit. Um, so, it, so here, for example, I, I am merging data with some other, uh, with, with some other data. So, we're, we're also, so when we merge different tables, we have the simplest possible join algorithm. Join, okay? As a database guy, I was saying, so, so essentially what we let people do is, I have a column, you have a column. They have to have exactly the same values, and we're going to do a join. Okay, I think it's a left outer join. Okay, and I was like, oh, we're just come, we're going to release a product with only one possible join. This is going to be so embarrassing. I'm going to go to Sigma. They're going to put me in the corner for, for you know, taking research uh, in, in database system and, and, and ignoring the last 30, 31 years of research. How, how am I going to, you know, so we did that. And very, you know, very, very few of our users asked for more than this very simple join. Okay, so I don't know what this means. But I don't, I'm not losing, and, and we will expand these capabilities, but I haven't lost any sleep since our launch um, on that. They did come and say, oh, we want more ways to visualize the data and more this and more that, and, and oh, by the way, wouldn't it be nice to have an API? And the, the nice thing about launching a product is it takes about 17 minutes after the, the product is launched, and you know exactly what your <laughs> users, you know, what, what you're going to do for the next three months. Okay? They just sort of gently tell you with many, many emails. Um, okay, uh, so this is the merge table, uh, very exciting. Um, the other, the last thing I want to uh, show you is the discussions. So here, um, again, you guys actually invented it uh, earlier, but the idea is that you can actually have discussions that are relevant to a column, a row, or an individual cell. And so, um, for example, if we're having a discussion about the value of something, and I actually decided to change the value because you convinced me as part of the discussion, then when we go later, I can actually see the discussion trail that led to the changing of the value. Okay, so this is valuable. And when you have a million rows, you really have to have the, the um, the, context, the discussion be very specific to the context. You can't just have it sort of on the side. And of course, you guys did it with fancy SQL queries. Uh, huh? I was going to ask a, a question about how, uh, how do you store these comments? 
uh, we actually store them on the side. Um, I don't think we do anything terribly um, fancy there. I, I, I heard about it today, actually. I'm interested in reading about it. So, um, so I'm, I'm at my conclusions. Um, and so what I want to, um, the message I want to uh, leave you with is I think there's still a lot to be done on, uh, on leveraging structured data on the web. I think there are really interesting connections of what can you do once you have large amounts of structured data to get even better value out of unstructured data. So for example, imagine seeing a table with rows that are talking about some relationship and now looking in text to see, okay, where do I see these same tokens occurring in a sentence okay, together? Maybe I can then, so for example, I, I see um, you know, Barack Obama USA. I can see, okay, Barack Obama is the president of USA somewhere in an index document. Now I can go and find deduce a pattern and look for presidents of other countries and therefore build, uh, find more, uh, more tuples that way. So the interplay between structured data and unstructured data I think is going to be one of the interesting directions here. Um, searching for tables is something we're currently uh, very interested in and it's, uh, it's still somewhat of an open problem. Fusion tables is a, a, an experiment into a database system for the masses. That's why the masses were in the title of the talk. Um, we're getting a lot of really good feedback, and I think you're going to see. Um, you know, I'm, I'm welcoming a lot of uh, feedback about this, so we can actually make databases accessible to an order of magnitude more people. So that's it. I'll end here. So, um, no, it's just another page. So there's no, uh, you know, the, the quality of pages on the web varies considerably. So I don't think we can make a claim that just because a page came from the deep web, it's in some sense better. Um, you know, so and in fact, if, if you try to convince the search quality people at Google about that, uh, <laughs> good luck. If, if, if you're unlikely to find results for that query, then that page will come up. So the, the thing is, you're getting it for free. Um, that's, that's one of the beauty of, of, uh, of the system. When, when you really need that page, and there are no other competing pages that are provably better, then it'll come up. So they, they, they tend to come up um, in the right places, and people tend to click on them with the same frequency that they click on other results. That's what we showed. So yeah, no, there's, um, there's no argument that I can make that says that a page that came from the deep web is better even with respect to certain queries. Yeah. A lot of the content that might be found when searching the web for tables and stuff might be like dynamic content that isn't really important to keep around. Is there work being done to separate, um, like let's say, prices of something that might change very frequently from uh, facts that are obviously going to stick for forever? Um, no. Uh, and, and so we don't actually keep the facts around. We, can't, we keep the page around. So if, you're, if, if we surfaced a page about the price of digital cameras, mm -hmm. suppose we said, you know, digital cameras, you know, uh, more than some number of pixels, okay? We're not actually keeping the information about the prices of those cameras in the index for answering. What we're doing is we're keeping the page with the results, but when the user clicks on the link, they're going to see the prices today. So it's sort of just a, a proxy for determining relevance. 
Um, and, and it's very hard to say what's, what facts is, are, you know, uh, are going to uh, stay forever and what, which aren't. Now, when I click on a link, am I actually getting a link to the query results yes. for the query you issue? Yes. The as query... As opposed to the, the, the page of the form for me to enter my own query. No, you're getting the... Uh, what we're doing for you is we're giving you... We're taking you right to the result answer, the, the page with the answers. So the URL has a get requested. Right? Yes. So which, by the way, I should say, we don't do this for post. Yeah. Post is because you can't, uh, you can't actually index that, or you need some other solution. Uh, the other thing about post is that um, post is for making state changes. So it's, more, it's, it's meant not as just an informational um, mechanism, but it's also for you know, changing your, you know, sending an email, right? Um, so we don't do posts at all. And so far, I can claim we have not, you know, reserved an airline ticket for any, on behalf of anybody without, uh, you know, we, we didn't, we actually didn't screw anything up yet. Uh, so, but there is a lot of valuable information in post that is not, that, is not um, that I'd love to have. So, and actually it turns out that if you take every uh, post site and instead of post you just do a get, it'll work in, a, I think half the, half the cases, it'll just work. So it's, it's because of the particular software that people are using to develop the site. Yeah. I think it's related to the other question. If I just type use cars and the first result is cars.com, and then I do uh, use cars uh, to go to 2005 in Indiana, does that mean I'll get uh, my first result will be cars.com in Indiana cars, the fourth to go to in cars.com, even though some other site might have more to go to in Indiana? So if, if we crawl the cars.com page, um, and if we hit on the particular Indiana pages, then there will be pages in the index that have uh, Toyota Corolla and they'll be Indiana somewhere. So that, uh, that page will be deemed relevant to your query. Now, if there are other pages that are, uh, also contain cars in Indiana, then these pages are going to be compared using the usual ranking uh, techniques. So I can't you know, at that point, it, th that's why, you know, you know we, we just give it to the ranking folks and they, uh, they do their thing. Um, but the, the page, the, the, the important point is that the page itself, the homepage of cars.com, doesn't mention Indiana, I mean, with all due respect, it doesn't mention Indiana or California, right? I mean, it's actually probably does, but it, it, it doesn't mention, you know, West Lafayette, um, which means that if you put that word in, it's just not going not to come up. Um, wow. Uh, um, I don't. You have till dinner time to, uh, to think about it. Answers. You have to dinner with her, so. <laughs> well, so I think the answer. So I've always, I've never uh, been a traditional database guy. Okay, I've never, uh, and so my answer is always being think out of the box. Think, think much more generally about data and what people want to do with data, rather than the actual database system. First. First build systems that enable people to do what they want. Figure out efficiency later, because you can always somehow make it, make it work fast. So a few years ago, and um, uh, uh, Mike Franklin and, and Dave Meyer and I came up with this idea of data spaces, which is, it's not really a new idea. It's just a way of reformulating some of the old ideas into uh, some, you know, a nicer, uh, a nicer story, which is, don't think about, the problem with databases is you always have to put a lot of effort in to structure your data and do all the right things before you get any benefit. And that's where you lose 95% of your customers. Okay, again, statistic made on the fly. But, uh, so it's, oh, think about data management as very little effort. Try to provide services on people's data without them having to do anything. When they see the return on their investment, when they, when they see that if they actually tell you that this column is of a certain type or of a certain, or related to this other column, and they will see that the benefit that they get out of doing that effort, then they will do it. So make, you know, make it um, bottom up, sort of uh, uh, pay as you go data management. And I think all the projects that I, that I built on, at Google, if I didn't have that frame of mind, I would, I would have a really bad midlife crisis. <laughs>